think we'll just wait. We'll wait for a minute or two for everyone to log in. Good evening from Los Angeles. Magandang gabi, Marayna Bangi. Welcome to panel five of the webinar series, Historicizing Disaster Risk Management, the Ecology of Isarog, or Mount Isarog and its Environs. I am Stephen Nakabado, Associate Professor of Anthropology and the Director of the Center for Southeast Asian Studies at UCLA. Before we start, I would like to recognize that as a land-grant institution, the Center for Southeast Asian Studies at UCLA acknowledges the Gabrielano Tongva peoples as the traditional land caretakers of Tobangar, Los Angeles Basin and Southern Channel Islands. This webinar series is a product of collaboration among various institutions, including the Partido State University, the Polytechnic University of the Philippines, the Center for Taiwan Philippines, Indigenous Knowledge, Local Knowledge and Sustainable Studies, or City Fields at the National Chenchi University, Taiwan, and the Program for Early Modern Southeast Asia, or PEMSI, which is a partnership among the University of Hawaii, Manoa Center for Southeast Asian Studies, Department of Anthropology, University of Washington, and the UCLA Center for Southeast Asian Studies. PEMSI is supported by a generous grant from the Henry Luce Foundation and various UCLA units. This series is supported by the Philippine Commission on Higher Education, the UCLA Coatsen Institute of Archaeology, and the UCLA Center for Medieval and Re Renaissance Studies. Panel 5 discusses sources of information and would provide nu nuanced understanding of how Southeast Asian, particularly Philippine groups, responded to various, various stimuli afforded by cultural entanglements. Particular emphasis will be placed on documentary sources that have the potential to link state responses with environmental signatures. I would like to thank the panelists and the moderators for their generosity. I know you're all busy and it's, it's a holiday here in the US. Um, I know um, yeah, that you're busy, but you have agreed to share your time to participate in this panel. Let me share a quick uh, a introduction, a video introduction for um, to to introduce the, our panelists and, and moderator. Panel five, titled Environmental and Economic History, consists of five panelists and one moderator from the Philippines and the United States. Our first panelist is Professor Kirby Clado Alvarez from the University of the Philippines, Diliman. Professor Alvarez is an assistant professor at the Department of History, College of Social Sciences and Philosophy at the University of the Philippines, Diliman. He finished Bachelor of Arts in History in 2010 and Master of Arts in History in 2014 in the UP Diliman. He obtained doctorate in history, art, and archaeology degree from the University of Namur in Belgium in 2019. The National Commission for Culture and the Arts awarded him the Young Historian's Prize 2015. His research interests include environmental history, history of science, and the local history of his hometown, Malabon. Our second panelist, also coming from the University of the Philippines, Diliman, is Professor Ruel V. Pagunsan. Professor Pagunsan is an associate professor at the Department of History, University of the Philippines, Diliman, 
where he also obtained his bachelor and master's degree in history. He holds a PhD in history from the National University of Singapore. He has published research papers in the Journal of Southeast Asian Studies, Philippine Social Science Review, and International Review of Environmental History, among others. His research interests focus on the histories of science and environment in the Philippines and currently working on an environmental history of nation building in the Philippines. Joining our set of panelists is Professor Lou Angeli Ocampo, also from the University of the Philippines, Diliman. Professor Ocampo is an assistant professor from the Department of Geography at the University of the Philippines, Diliman. She is currently the coordinator for the social sciences of the Tri-College Philippine Studies program in the same university. Her research interests include political ecologies, indigenous knowledge and resource management, and risk perception of social natural hazards and disasters. Our next panelist is Professor Patrick Henry R. Manguera from the Polytechnic University of the Philippines. Professor Manguera is a graduate of Bachelor of Arts in History from the University of the Philippines, Diliman, and is currently taking up his doctorate degree in Public Administration from the Polytechnic University of the Philippines, Manila. He also holds a Master's degree in Public Administration and as well as Bachelor of Laws degree. He was a former chief of the Center for Indigenous People Studies of the Polytechnic University of the Philippines and a faculty at the PUP Department of History. He co-authors several books, Kasaysayan ng Bayang Pilipino Pagbubuo Tungo sa Pagkabansa and Kasaysayan ng Bayan sa Gisag ng Kasarinlan, Kasaysayan, Kalinangan, Diwa at Kabuluhan, among others. Our fifth and last panelist is Professor David Bakes from the University of California, Riverside. Professor Biggs is an environmental historian, someone who studies the relationships and entanglements between humans and natural systems with a regional specialization in Vietnam and Southeast Asia, but has creative interest in modern world history. His research focuses on the ways that historic human interventions, such as public works construction and destructive actions, such as war, have not only reshaped landscapes, but also produced legacies that often continue to play into international, environmental, and development politics. He also works with other related issues, such as chemical weapons histories and cleanups international river basin management, and military base transfers. Further, his work draws heavily from use of historic maps and aerial photography and integrate this into many of his studies. Currently, he is working on two projects, an environmental history of Southeast Asia and a study of cities and shorelines, especially the deeply storied riverfront and canals of Saigon. The moderator for Panel 5 is Professor Barbara Watson Andaya from the University of Hawaii. Professor Andaya is Professor of Asian Studies at the University of Hawaii. She was formerly Director of the UH Center for Southeast Asian Studies, and in 2005 to 2006, she was President of the American Association of Asian Studies. She has been the recipient of a John Simon Guggenheim Award and the University of Hawaii Regents Medal for Excellence in Research. She has lived and taught in Malaysia, Australia, New Zealand, Indonesia, Singapore, 
the Netherlands, and the United States. Her specific area of expertise is the history of the Western Malay Indonesia archipelago, on which she has published widely, but she maintains an active teaching and research interest across all Southeast Asia. Her publications include Perak, the Abode of Grace, a study of an 18th century Malay state in 1979, to live as brothers, Southeast Sumatra in the 17th and 18th centuries in 1993, with Leonard Y. Andaya, a history of early modern Southeast Asia in 2015, and a third edition of A History of Malaysia in 2017. She is currently general editor of the new Cambridge History of Southeast Asia. A virtual round of applause, please, for the panel five, panelists, and moderator. Thank you. Uh, now I give the floor to Professor Andaya. Well, thank you very much to all those people who put together that video. I, um, it was really enlightening, and um, we, we all appreciate it very much, if I can speak for all the panelists. So... My first uh, obligation is just to make sure that everybody has um, presented, is, is presenting themselves as an environmental person. And if to ask you if you would like to add anything to that very, very good and uh, a comprehensive video that we just saw. So I thought in, I'd follow the same order, if you don't mind, that we had in the video itself and start with Ro. Is there anything you'd like to say, especially about your current work and how it might relate to the env environmental history in particular? Hi, hello, hello everyone. Uh, good morning here from Manila. So again, I'm uh, Ruel Pagunsan. I'm uh, affiliated with the uh, Department of History, uh, University of the Philippines, uh, Diliman. Um, currently, I am in, uh, I'm part of a research and publication project uh, sponsored, uh, funded by the University of the Philippines system. Uh, and this is actually a, a, university, a university's contribution to the national quincentennial celebration of the Battle of Mactan. But the project uh, 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 deals not only with the Battle of Mactan and the introduction of Christianity. Uh, it, it revisits the uh, entire colonial uh, regime of uh, the Spaniards here in the Philippines. And the project um, hopes to bring in new materials, new information, new perspectives, such as the environmental history. Uh, so my, my paper, my contribution in this project um, investigates the, the national history production in the late 18th century, um, uh, the sending of specimens, for instance, in, in Madrid, and looking into uh, the colonial, the, the intellectual foundations no, of, uh, of how the natural history investigations uh, contributed to the uh, discourse of, of the tropics uh, in the centuries to come. So that's, uh, that's my main uh, research project uh, at the moment. Yeah. Thank, thank you very much. So, and so now let's turn then to Kirby. Yeah, so uh, uh, good morning, everyone. So good morning from Manila. So similar with uh, uh, Professor Pagun Simon, I'm also part of the same project and I'm currently working on uh, the history of disasters, particularly history of earthquakes and volcanic eruption. So uh, aside from that, I'm also working on, on uh, analyzing the, the published or produced scientific studies on disasters since the second half of the 19th century uh, towards the end of the 20th century. And I'm relating those uh, materials to not only to the, to the knowledge production scheme of the, uh, of the era, but also to, to larger, to larger uh, social uh, context, particularly uh, with regards to nationalism. So how would those scientific studies uh, formed the the corpus of scientific knowledge that uh, that served as the what they call the amino narratives or the building blocks of, of modern Philippine nation uh, in the twentieth century. So I'm currently working on those uh, topics uh, right now. Thank you. Thank you very much. So now, Luan. 
Um, yes, hello everyone. Um, I'm Luan Ocampo. I'm an assistant professor from the UP Department of Geography. Um, professor Alvarez and I were part of a research project on local adaptation and resilience in 2019. <laughs> Sorry, and it was him who actually invited me to join this workshop. Uh, my research was about indigenous knowledge and perception of social natural hazards among small-scale gold miners in Etogon, Benguet, including um, Ibaloy and Tancanay miners. In the context of um, political ecology, so I looked at how policies on mining and resource access um, changed the resource utilization patterns and access of the miners. Um, I also investigated um, local and indigenous knowledge, uh, especially those that are relevant to disaster risk reduction. Um, yes, um, I've also investigated risk perception. Um, I'm currently working on a, on a paper about um, disaster experience, risk perception, and evacuation decision. So, and also something about the production of hazard states. So that's it, thank you. Thank, thank you very much. And, and now I turn to Patrick. Oh, I think you're muted. I think I think you are still muted. Okay, well, um, <clears throat> we'll come back to to Patrick in a minute. David, can you pick up the 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 baton at this stage? And we'll come back when Patrick's um because he's there's some environmental problems I think at his end. <laughs> Maybe the, the headphone is not plugged in. Um, that happened to me last week in a class. Um, hi, I'm, I'm David Biggs, and I'm uh, not an expert on the Philippines. In fact, I'm very new uh, to the local histories of the Philippines, except what I studied uh, in the past as a student. But I'm, I'm really fascinated in the potential for comparisons, in part because uh, I've spent much of my work studying, doing research in Vietnam and thinking about nation building and thinking about colonialism in that context. But what is so interesting when I think about disasters and especially rising sea levels is how the nation is, in a sense, we should maybe challenge that as historians and and thinking about these problems that they're not national problems, they're really global problems. And so many, and even if we look back in the history of the Philippines or Vietnam, we see so much regional interaction in, in flow. So um, I'm uh, ha very happy to be here and uh, to contribute uh, what I can. Um, but I think the video did a, a better job than I could of explaining myself. <laughs> So I'll, I'll, I'll turn it over. Well, thank you all very much. I think um, we're still waiting for Patrick's sound, but we'll, we can come back to him, I think. Okay. Um, yes, ma'am. Patrick, you're morning. okay? Just, you're ready? Okay, good. Go yes, for it. Thank you. Very sorry, ma'am, for the... Uh, We've all been anticipating uh, what you have to say. Yes, ma'am. Uh, good morning uh, from uh, Manila. So I'm Patrick Henry Manguera from the Department of History of the Polytechnic University of the Philippines. 
Uh, I was the former chief of the Center for Indigenous uh, People Studies of PUP. Uh, the center is an office uh, under the supervision of the Institute of Human and Social Development of our university. And then uh, the center was created in 2018. Uh, this is a relatively new office in the university. Uh, the mandate of which, of the center, is to raise people's awareness and consciousness on the IP culture in the urban setting, especially here in Metro Manila, where uh, we would like to propagate the uh, the knowledge about uh, the IP, the indigenous people of the Philippines. Another mandate of the center is to create a research hub of the IP resources, research materials, and a venue for researchers to collaborate and share available resources for an in-depth knowledge of the IPs and as well as the IP community in the country. Uh, we have So far, we have conducted uh, uh, extension programs, particularly in the province of Bukidnon in Mindanao, in coordination with several non-governmental organizations like the Kit Kitanglad Integrated uh, NGOs and the local government units as well. And uh, we were able to observe the importance of our IP communities uh, in the preservation of the natural environment, particularly in the area of Mount Kitanglad in Mindanao. Uh, for example, the salient collaboration between the national government through the Department of Environment and Natural Resources the local government units, as well as the NGOs. We have met uh, cultural leaders and as well as the IP leaders of the communities and established a solid relationship. And it was realized through seminars, workshop, and this engagement would probably lead to possible research collaboration in the future, as well as to formulate uh, policies and proposals to our policymakers in order to improve the lives of our IP brothers and sisters as well as the protection of natural resources in the Philippines. Thank you very much, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Well, I think that's a good note to, to start our discussion on because part of the theme of these seminars is the interaction between the academic world and the public world as well, and tr the transfer of knowledge. But because environmental history uh, you are all pioneers, you're all pioneers, because it's a relatively new field in Southeast Asian studies, even in the world, you could say. And so what I wanted to ask you, and perhaps we could start with, with Kirby, um, but all of you, I'd like you to, to think about it, um, is, is what do you think, what kind of avenues does environmental history bring to history as a discipline, what what does it change? What, how is the future of historical teaching history going to be shaped by this new field? Okay, sorry. Thank you for the question. So I think uh, my 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 interest in environmental history uh, started uh, from uh, my own personal experience uh, uh, as a. Uh, as a young student living in a city that is below sea level, that is perennially, uh, perennially uh, hampered by floods. Uh, uh, my interest in environmental history uh, emerged from that personal, ex uh, from those personal experiences. So, so I think uh, uh, what we can uh, we we can define or we can give uh, a definition to to environmental history as some sort of a subfield in environment in 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 historical studies, wherein uh, we 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 give priority to the complex relationship between uh, not the natural environment. And the in the humans or the human communities, okay? mm -hmm. and uh, in particular, based on my work, uh, I study disasters, and I consider disasters uh, as as uh, turning points and as watersheds of of uh, the, the the historical development of human communities or societies. Okay? Uh, for example, in the Philippines, we can we can all uh, agree or uh, we can be in consensus that. Uh, Philippine history uh, is still very political. The periodization, the mm -hmm. the uh, the the important events that uh, that manifest uh, the the uh, or the, the events that uh, dominate 
the national narrative or the national story. So uh, what I do uh, in, in pursuing this particular subfield is to, is to bring in and make cases, okay? uh, make typhoons, earthquakes, and volcanic eruptions as, as cases of historical study or, or, uh, or subjects of historical study. So we can, we can uh, consider the eruption of Mayon or eruption of Taal as a turning point in, in Philippine history. Okay, so so uh, through that uh, we can uh, we we uh, we can put premium on on environmental processes as uh, as turning points in in uh, in studying history or studying Philippine history. So so that I think is one important uh, uh, aspect that we can look into uh, to appreciate this particular subfield in history. So make environmental processes as historical events worth studying. So events are not just uh, are no longer wars or treaties yeah. or. Uh, uh, some sort of political takeover, but they're the kind of events that affect ordinary people in which human resilience and yes. agency can be uh, brought in. Um, Ro, would you like to add what your thoughts to that, those comments? Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, thank you. So I think uh, to add to what Kirby um, had shared, uh, so the Philippines is uh, not only, I think the, the Philippine experience are good sources or um, good sources in which we can uh, tell a new um, history of the nation. Uh, it's not only about the history of disasters as part of the environmental history. Uh, the Philippines, of course, uh, remains an agricultural community, uh, agricultural country. Um, it relies on uh, fishing and other. Um, sources of uh, livelihood. So I think this kind of, uh, of stories um, uh, are rich sources or points upon which we can examine uh, the, the life of the nation, the life or the, the, the historical narrative of the Philippines. So uh, for me, environmental history enriches our understanding of the past uh, by, by, by providing new dimensions to what we normally interpret history through, through political uh, views, to uh, economic perspective, to social perspective. So, um, and I think environment is something also that um, the local communities can, can connect with. Uh, so stories such as uh, the food supplies or agricultural crops you know, on how, uh, on, on medical remedies, livelihood, and even their songs, their recreations, their riddles. I think these are uh, ways upon which we can uh, add or um, uh, enrich the the uh, Philippine history through environmental stories, through environmental history. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, um, thank you. Thank you, Ra. Well, I think um, we can move then to what Patrick was saying earlier about the involvement of Indigenous com communities in this story, in a story that they've often been marginalised, a national story where they haven't really played a part. So... Um, is that Patrick? Do you think that's the for you for you personally? That's the major uh, um, contribution of environmental history, or do you think there's other ways that environmental history adds to our thinking about the past? Um, well, I think, ma'am, uh, coming from a I came from a, a province in, in the Philippines, which uh, had this history of uh, the worst mining disaster in the world, which is the Merkapur mining mm. incident in 1996. And probably my exposure to that uh, probably led me to the interest uh, in the study of the, uh, the environment and environmental history. Um, to which I, I would like to engage also. Um, together with the, the study on IP communities, because I think the indigenous people had their own fair share of the indigenous knowledge when it comes to the preservation of the, uh, the environment. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, the Department of History of the Polytechnic University of the Philippines uh, has decided to revise its uh, curriculum in the, coming, uh, uh, in the coming school year 
probably by next year, so that uh, we will be offering uh, the subject environmental history as part of our major subjects in the Bachelor of Arts curriculum in the AB History program of the university. Mm -hmm. So this is probably one of our commitment uh, in order to pursue uh, the knowledge about environmental history. Thank you. That's, that's, uh, I'd like to come back to the whole teaching of environmental history, particularly in the Philippines later on in terms of resources and, and materials that are available for students, but that's extremely interesting. So, Noan, we were, we, uh, Kirby and, and Patrick, and I'm sure others have talked about this sort of real passion that they have developed for this topic that's really come out of their own personal experience. You know, it's, 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 it's rooted in their, their own personal past. I think a lot of people actually develop that kind of, of interest in a particular field because of their own experiences. Did you have anything like that in the past? How did you come to, to study environmental, uh, environmental aspects in a geography department? Um, thank you, um, Barbara. Uh, it's interesting that I think I'm the only um, geographer from this group, but I, I can um, really say that geography and environmental history share so much in common. Um, going back to your question about personal um, experiences that led me to be interested in environmental history. Um, at the personal level, um, I really couldn't um, think of any, but it's more on it developed while I was doing my dissertation. As I told you um, earlier, uh, I was interested in risk perception, um, the production of hazardscapes. And even in geography, when you talk about transformations, adaptation strategies, um, changing indigenous knowledge system, establishments of networks and linkages and their impacts, you can't just take a snapshot of what is going on um, at the present. You always have to go back. And the reason why um, I, I got interested in uh, political ecology and Escape is because uh, of the importance of what happened in the past and how they impact how things um, unfold um, at the present and, and how they would impact. Um, I was interested in risk perception and, and evaluation decision, but um, risk perception are actually um, affected by previous disaster experiences. So disasters happen when um, those experiences were not harnessed <laughs> enough to, to create this or to, um, yes, to trigger the sense of threat among people. Mm -hmm. So those um, 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 connections, um, I believe that even if I'm coming from the Department of Geography, um, are very much um, interlinked and mm -hmm. had some um, overlaps perhaps or interaction mm -hmm. with environmental history. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I think I think you're right. I think what Kirby was saying about the events of history, events become memories. And memories play a very important part in the way people think about the past. And the past is remembered in different ways. And that's one of the re one of the aspects of history and its relationship to the present that's so interesting. And although David has worked in a very different environment from the Philippines. Um, he's brought similar kinds of, of concerns and interests to the table. So, David, could you tell us how you became interested and what you feel that environmental history has opened up since you were also really working, you were working at the, at the edge of that field when it first began to develop? Yeah, thanks. Um, my father uh, was a nuclear engineer and... Uh, he worked in the Navy first in a weapons program, and then he did peaceful nuclear engineer. And I remember as a child uh, taking a tour inside a nuclear reactor before it was fueled. And what was so amazing to me about nuclear energy <laughs> was the, the scale, the, the time scale for nuclear waste, the, the power of stars being harnessed to do what fossil fuels had done for so long, but also um, just thinking about the complexity of these environmental events 
And I lived in a fishing community where the nuclear plant was sited for several years. And um, these, these experienced the juxtaposition between this nuclear energy plant, um, which was the same type as the Fukushima one. Uh, <laughs> when you have a father who's a nuclear engineer, you learn about all kinds of strange things. We took tours of nuclear museums in New Mexico. Um, but my other friends were, fish, were uh, parents were fisher people and fish stocks were crashing and people were losing their jobs. And my town was a, a microcosm of what's happening in the world, really, where traditional uh, you, you know, fishing and other things are coming up against this new uh, sort, sort of forms. Mm -hmm. And I, I would say one thing that I think about a lot more now than I did when I started my projects um, 20 odd years ago um, is uh, dialectics. <laughs> and I know that's a big word, but it, for historians, especially, we think about, we thanks to Marx, we think about historical materialism about modes of production, about economic shifts in capitalism. And then thanks to the German historians, we think about state formation. And these are like the dominant trends in how academic historians have written history. But these trends are important for our audiences if it's Vietnam, the Philippines, United States but it doesn't capture that complexity that I experienced when I was a child. And I want history to do that. And I, I really appreciate that Luan is here to keep us honest <laughs> because geography is so important for thinking about landscapes and space and um, about agency, um, you know, and there are so many new ideas in geography and sociology about in about how we think about material and semiotic or idea connections um, about what is a landscape um, in, in how we historicize these landscapes um, when we think about vernacular knowledge and naming uh, toponyms um, maps as representational spaces um, incredible theoretical work, whether it's, you know, actor network theory or, you know, neo-Marxian ideas, um, you know, so many different things. So I think it's really important for environmental historians to really be careful in thinking about what are their assumptions or what is their framing? Uh, where is that framing coming from? and really to be open, whether it's subaltern studies or different kinds of spatial ideas and cosmologies. Um, and I think the uh, last thing I'll say is that I think it's really important as we write to, to really try to write in new ways. Um, to, you know, I, so for example, I wrote a book called Footprints of War about militarization in Vietnam. And the main thing I try and do in that book is not to, to privilege one disaster, one conflict, the American war, but rather to see it as a series of a, a dialectic, a spatial dialectic that's also historical related to past military disruptions. And anyway, so I think it's important for environmental historians to in a sense, explode the framing of history and try to come up with new frame, new framings. I, yes, I think that the, the academic um, reconstitution of history is a very significant part of this endeavor. But I'd like to come back, if you don't mind, to the whole question of the academic relationship with the people whose past we are trying to recover. And you, David, you mentioned um, local top and local knowledge. And um, I'd like just to start, go back maybe to Luann. Um, do you think that academics, it doesn't matter what their discipline is, people working in the field have a kind of, uh, have, ha, ha, 
how can they contribute to the uh, survival of local knowledge, which is often as trees disappear or as fish disappear, you know, the, that knowledge about the world around us that rests in vocabulary very often is disappearing or in personal experience. Okay, uh, thank you, Barbara. Um, I think um, first and foremost, we academics must um, develop a genuine um, interest and appreciation and recognition of indigenous knowledge that, that they are valid sources of information, especially since they evolved um, in the local context, they are place-based, they are unique. One group, even from the, from the same ethnic group, for example, would manifest um, a very um, unique and particular knowledge of their surroundings. So um, interest in that kind of um, information should be appreciated um, by academics. Mm -hmm. And then um, think of creative ways on how um, these things can be uh, can be put out in the open, so to speak. For example, um, in the project that um, Kirby and I worked on, one of the activities that we had to do was to um, talk to um, indigenous groups, local communities, um, um, inviting uh, participants from different age groups, from different gender. Um, so we have um, these community elders um, talking about their experiences, their knowledge, um, their, yes, things like that. And you would see that the younger participants would often laugh at some of the stories mm -hmm. being told by, uh, by the elders. But in the process, um, in that activity alone, so many things are happening. Um, elders are uh, transferring their knowledge to the young ones. The young ones are learning from um, the elders. And um, as academics, um, we have the opportunity to capture this exchange and put them in writing some, and somehow, you know, immortalize them <laughs> through our research, valorize them. That's actually the main goal of the project, to valorize indigenous knowledge. So I think these kinds of um, activities are very important. And like, as I've mentioned before, because, uh, uh, yes, we have to go beyond the scientific and then scientific uh, divide. That's where I'm coming from um, when it comes to indigenous knowledge. First, we have to um, recognize and appreciate the validity of this information before we are able to take it to the next level and preserve, promote, or what, what, whatever it is that we wanted to do. So, yeah, that's it. Thank you. I hope I answered your question. Kirby, you want to, wanted to say something? To add or, or to, to, to give my uh, take on the importance of indigenous or local uh, knowledge, okay, we can also apply that, for example, even in archival research. So one of the difficulties or one of the things that we, we uh, usually encounter, we usually observe, especially those working in the archives, is that most of the sources, for example, in the Philippines, were written in Spanish, and written from the perspective of, of the Spanish or from the colonizer. So, so uh, in, in my years of, uh, of doing archival research on uh, studying disasters, uh, it's very difficult, it's really very difficult to, 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 uh, to look for documents written by natives or uh, uh, documents written by natives in local languages. Okay, so most of them, even though they contain uh, narratives of the of the uh, natives, most of them are written in Spanish. So most probably those were written by either escribanos or by the by local gov local government officials. But uh, just to share this interesting uh, document, so uh, I found this in the uh, the uh, the Franciscan archives in Madrid. Okay, and as you can see. Uh, this document is uh, written by the natives of Tayabas after the 1743 earthquake. So the 1743 earthquake uh, uh, devastated uh, many towns foot of, of uh, Mount Banahaw. And this document is written in Tagalog. Okay, this is written in 18th century Tagalog and it contains interesting, a lot of information about the, the worldview and the, and the agency 
of the natives in determining what's best for them at the onset or the aftermath of the disaster. For example, in this letter, they requested uh, the, the, the government or the they requested directly to the king to allow them to reestablish parts of the town that were uh, parts of the town that were destroyed by the earthquake and by the the mud flow from the from from Mount Banahaw, and they requested their town to be transferred to another place because they believe those town historically uh, uh, those uh, the new location the new settlement. Uh, was more uh, or was uh, uh, much safer compared to the old town that was, that was established by uh, the Spaniards uh, uh, centuries earlier. So using this document, we can identify the, the idea of local knowledge, the agency of the natives when it comes to uh, when it comes to disaster rehabilitation. So just to support the idea that uh, recognizing indigenous or local language is as uh, is as important as uh, studying other aspects of environmental history. And in relation to David's a uh, point of of uh, converging history, in, in converging geography with history in in pursuing environmental history studies. See, we can we can uh, also do that even in the most uh, peculiar uh, material such as archival documents. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, th th that's a, a wonderful intervention, I think. You know, that's a reminder that if we go to the archives with different kinds of questions, looking for different kinds of sources and... and um, but, well, I was just thinking when I was reading something the other night about the kinds of woods that were used to build the ships and the galleon trade, you know, there's a whole list of them in the, in the Spanish sources, all the different kinds of woods, and it took 2,000 trees, they claim, to build one galleon and so on and so forth. But when I was thinking that, I reading that, I was thinking about the imagination of, you know, how it was for people to go into the, to the, to the forest to, get trees, what it was like to be away from their family. How, oh, this, is, this, is not, this is a question that I just thought of now, but do you think that where, when we're working on environmental history, imagination comes into play as well? If the archival sources are not so helpful, can we use um, imagination? Can we read back from later material? into the past? Is that a, a methodological um, technique that you would think useful or, or, or risky? Yeah, I, um, for me, I think um, uh, it's a very good way of uncovering the, the story of uh, the indigenous people especially for materials such as archival materials, uh, which are sh dominantly shaped by the Western Spanish uh, European uh, uh, perspective. So you really have to crack the, the, the parchment in order to you know, uh, get um, that kind of the narrative that, uh, that you want uh, by bringing in the the story uh, of the indigenous people, the Filipino people, the, the center. I had the same experience as, as Kirby, actually, you know, in, in looking into the history of um, uh, natural history production in 18th century. Uh, so most of the documents um, in the Spanish archives are basically uh, names of uh, the sponsors, uh, the governor generals who sponsored the, the collection of the specimens, for instance. Or those uh, who sponsored the, the the shipment of specimens from Manila to Madrid, uh, you seldom see the, the role of the natives in this kind of documents, uh, and they are mostly relegated into um, uh, into activities such as uh, collecting specimens or uh, carrying the carrying the uh, the the bags of of, of expeditioners, for instance, so and they are mostly unnamed in the documents. Uh, so, but sometimes there are um, references to the kind of works that they contributed to uh, 
actually is to the production. Uh, for instance, uh, since uh, they have to capture the images of, of, the, of the specimens, for instance, they have to rely to uh, indigenous illustrators, indigenous uh, painters, for instance, uh, because before they can send these specimens to Madrid. So that kind of uh, that kind of contribution um, are not normally highlighted or uh, are seldom mentioned in archival sources. So I think uh, uh, you have to really use your imagination uh, on in, in, in creating a kind of narrative uh, that will somehow um, lessen the focus to uh, the contributions of uh, colonialism and, uh, and bring forth the, into the table the, the, the contributions of the natives. So uh, it's really a, 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 a of, it's really important to use that kind of historical imagination you know, to, to recreate this story. Plus, of course, uh, as what David explained earlier, um, it's also important to look into the other disciplines such as anthropology, yeah. sociology, uh, archaeology, and, and geography to, um, to to contribute further to your analysis, to your historical analysis. Yeah. And well, let's uh, your mention of cross disciplinary research is is intriguing because uh, across all disciplines, I think uh, over the last. 40 years, perhaps one of the fields that's really shown development is the idea that men and women have sometimes similar experiences of the past, they're sometimes very different of the past, and too often the past is written from the perspective of, of men. So Patrick, when you're collecting material um, in Mindanao, and did you, um, did you see differences in the way men or women talked about the kind of disasters or how they dealt with the, those sorts of experiences in the past? Uh, Mom, based on our uh, experience, so we, we rely heavily on the uh, uh, oral history as a form mm -hmm. of uh, as, as a form of historical method in doing uh, historical research when we deal probably with the IP communities. Uh, this is given the fact that uh, there is a limitation as to the written sources and other substantive evidence that can be used or found uh, within that specific community. To which, uh, but. I think uh, there are specific roles of uh, men and women within the IP communities, and I think this this should be emphasized, especially the role of, of women, uh, which is, should not be limited only that uh, as to that they are childbearing, that they are the ones who perform the uh, chores inside the house, but uh, within the IP community, I think there's a there's a great um, uh, potential as to the matter of leadership uh, within the community, as well as their role in the community, uh, a role which encompasses uh, things like environmental protection, their involvement within the, uh, within the political uh, arena of that specific uh, IP community. And we have seen that, ma'am. We have clearly seen the role of, uh, of women uh, in the societies that we have uh, conducted the research, mm -hmm. particularly in Mindanao, uh, mm -hmm. they are either as a religious leader, uh, they perform uh, several uh, rituals, and uh, based on our engagement, uh, they went to Manila, uh, they even went to our school in PUP, and uh, we had all the chances to, to, to be able to talk to them. And uh, they are in the uh, uh, so-called... Um, upper level of the, uh, mm -hmm. of, of the society of that particular IP mm -hmm. community. So they have a specific roles, mm -hmm. uh, not only limited to uh, roles uh, within the family, but uh, within the specific society as well. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, the value and the importance of uh, oral history as a historical method uh, in, history in local history writing should be emphasized. And that uh, our indigenous people which we consider as probably the people who are very neglected uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, economics, uh, uh, political participation. Um, and this comes the fact that 
uh, based on our research, uh, historical data, historical theories, I think this should be translated into something uh, valuable to them. Uh, like, for example, on matters of policy, governmental policy, uh, when we talk about the ancestral lands of these uh, people, uh, and then strengthening the, uh, the national office uh, with regards to the indigenous people, which is the NCIP, the National Commission for Indigenous uh, Peoples. And uh, I think they should even have representatives in Congress uh, in order for them to voice out their, uh, uh, their plea. And over, uh, this is to be able to protect um, a national treasure, a national identity. The IP, the IP communities are our national identity. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's very strong, very strong statement. Very, um, very meaningful, I think. Uh, so um, it really brings me around to, to some of the other questions we've been thinking about in terms of the Philippines in Southeast Asia. So all of you, except um, uh, David, are specialists on the Philippines. But this is, this is a project which is looking at the early modern period across the region as a whole. So as we know, this was a period of, of intensifying global interaction and which in which Southeast Asia as a region was heavily involved because of the kind of products uh, that it could bring to the international market. So um, David, could I come back for you just, just um, for you, could you just in your teaching experience, um, what do you think are the, the major developments in terms of international connections in Southeast Asia that came about as a result of this global trade? Gosh. Um, <laughs> That's a that's a that's a tough one, you know. That's a good. I give that question to my students a lot. Like significance. What are the three most significant things that happened, based on the reading? Um, boy, um, I think if we are taking these global experiences before industrialization in the mid 19th or early 19th century. You know, uh, John Smell talks about the industrial colonialism really changes the nature of colonialism in the region in, in so many ways um, in the sense that European colonialism is really predominant in a way uh, because of commodity markets for rubber or coal or um, blast furnaces and, and processes that are in for that moment in the 19th century really centered in Europe and in and, and America. And so, so they're really powerful. But outside of that, in early modern period, what's so interesting is that we have Islamic modernism. We have really different networks for expressing what it means, what, what, whatever it means to be modern. Um, what, or what it means to be part of these global networks. Um, we have the Ming Dynasty in China and Chinese mercantile networks, the new and old Silk Roads. Um, just, I think it's a really interesting period for looking at alternative ways of articulating identities in, in, in the region. Um, especially identities that are not limited by these modern geo bodies like Tong Chai writes about in, in Siam. You know, it's before that. So we have completely different cosmologies and understandings of, of kingship and relationships and reciprocity uh, between workers and uh, elites, who are the elites? Um, I think it's that plurality that's really, it's really fascinating in that time. And it has a kind of a, and the reason it's interesting is because it has resonance today when the state fails at some local problem or disaster, we see 
the expression of these other connections or in the case of Mindanao and the relationship of different indigenous groups in Mindanao, for example, that have connections to Southern China in, in the 1600s or, or 1500s. And they are re-articulating those connections now um, be, just for, for, different, for different reasons. And um, last thing I'll say too, uh, cities are very nationalized spaces and um, there's a pressure since World War II for nationalists to erase what was there below. And for example, archeologists digging in Saigon find uh, place names or pottery or other material evidence of the Khmer people who were there in the 1600s <laughs> or the Chinese uh, Teochew people who were building pottery works in the 1700s. So I think in our teaching, if, if we can, the early modern period is really useful for pushing back against 20th century nationalism mm -hmm. and national space making. Mm -hmm. Well, that, that actually brings me back to the Philippines because the early modern period as a period, well, when I was a graduate student, there wasn't such a period. It was just the classical states and then colonialism. And there was a kind of a funny space in between that people didn't know what to do with it. They just called it pre-colonial or something like that. Um, the Philippines was difficult to deal with because of the Spanish domination from, from the 17th century. But I think now the advent of global history, world history has really identified the early modern period. The, the dates can be a bit um, shaky, but say from about 1400 to 1800, it's really a period of, of global change in very significant ways, it, it has been argued. Now, I'd like to ask, especially the, the historians from the Philippines, do you think that's really um, relevant to Philippine history to identify the early modern period as something significant? And how would this relate to environmental change? So who's brave enough to take that on? Raul, you'd like to start? I mean, what I'm trying to say is, do you think of an early, when you plan a course, when you do, do you think of an early modern period, is that in the, the Philippine psyche, historical psyche at the moment? Or is it yet to come? Uh, okay, I, I think it's still a work in progress. Um, I think um, uh, the, the, the audience is still um, prefers the nation building stories, the nation building narratives. But in terms of research, I think, in terms of uh, the works of uh, junior faculty, junior, um, junior academics here in the Philippines, there are already, I think, um, um, projects that uh, push back uh, this nation building, this, this nation narrative, and somehow look into the Philippine history as a uh, history of connections mm -hmm. with uh, the other parts of what we call now Southeast Asia, uh, the narratives of networks, uh, the narratives of uh, mobility uh, mm -hmm. and, and exchanges, uh, especially, and I think that the kind of, uh, of, of concepts uh, are helpful in positioning the Philippines uh, within the wide the uh, region, especially in the context of early modern Asia, uh, early modern Southeast Asia. So when we think, for instance, of uh, mobility, not only of uh, the population, but also of the mobility of, of plants, of flora and fauna, of diseases, for instance, mm -hmm. I think uh, that, uh, that is one way of, uh, uh, of sharing or uh, providing a, a different narrative for Philippine history. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, but I think for me, it's still a work in progress. Um, mm -hmm. uh, there are still a lot to do. There are still a lot of collaborations between historians and, and archaeologists and anthropologists and geographers. Uh, and in presenting this kind of story to uh, the Filipino people, mm -hmm. So I think uh, what we are doing now, uh, junior scholars, uh, is uh, one step at a time. Um, uh, uh, we have almost every year, uh, our department is um, sharing or conducting workshops, uh, seminars, trainings to uh, school, school districts, you know, uh, provincial colleges. You know, and uh, part of uh, in this workshop, which tried to also introduce uh, new materials, new perspectives in Philippine history. So um, I, for me, uh, it has started already in the Philippines, but uh, uh, historians, young historians, uh, have to do a lot of work uh, uh, still in order to uh, uh, you know, uh, push uh, forward these uh, new perspectives in, in Philippine history and uh, somehow connect Philippine history with uh, the larger, with the global uh, regional uh, history. And, and I think you mentioned um, the mobility of not only of ideas, of technologies, but of also of, of um, diseases. Of uh, So I was thinking just as you were talking, um, one of the, one of the, aspects that I, I encountered in my research on the 17th century was a new form of smallpox that arrived from India to which for which people were not um, people in the interior had not been subject so people along the coast were generally immune because but it ravaged whole areas of Sumatra when in the 17th century because of this new um, new form of a, new, a smallpox, but a new form, new virulent form. And so it would be interesting to see how the environment is affected by that when people die or they abandon an area, what results, what is the environmental effect of that, um, not in other parts of the region too, and sometimes collaboration is the way that you can get there. Um, and so, um, Kirby, how do you do you think the early modern period is is a real period in Philippine history or not? A question. Okay. Uh, to begin with, uh, we're going to look at the curriculum of the BA history program at the in in, in our university. Uh, uh, when we uh, are, some of our undergraduate major subjects uh, are are categorized or still based uh, or are still based on the the uh, the what we call the conventional periodization in Philippine history. So we have a, a subject on colonial Philippines, colonial Philippines one under Spain, colonial Philippines two under American and and uh, 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 Japanese occupation. Then we have contemporary Philippines. So basically, that's post-war Philippines until the the post martial era. Okay? We have subjects in Southeast Asia, but you can. Uh, 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 but those subjects are 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 categorized uh, into two: traditional Southeast Asia and modern Southeast Asia. We see traditional, basically, it's the pre-colonial Southeast Asia until probably uh, I think uh, uh, Professor Pagunsan can 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 correct me on this uh, until the late 18th century. And when you say modern Southeast Asia, basically uh, Southeast Asia at the advent of of of, of European expansion. Okay. So, so basically, uh, the idea of early modern period, uh, it's still, uh, it's still uh, an, an abstract thing. Okay. Uh, uh, for, uh, if you're going to look at uh, our, our BA history curriculum. Uh, I'm currently part of a, a project where in, we are reviewing some textbooks used in, in several private schools in the Philippines. And, and uh, Almost all of those textbooks are based on the prescribed Department of Education uh, curriculum on social studies. And, and the history subjects in grades five and grade six still follow the traditional or the conventional. So pre-colonial, colonial, post-war period, blah, 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 until the, until the contemporary era. 
Okay, so basically the idea of early modern period in Philippine history and Philippine history writing and 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 teaching is still a a a, a, a work in progress. Okay, but I think uh, in terms of research, okay, uh, we are starting to to uh, to adapt or to to uh, uh, to think of applying this this uh, periodizations being used. In, in in Southeast Asian studies in the context of the Philippines. Uh, for example, based on my own research, okay, I'm trying to figure out how can I locate the, the scientific development uh, uh, pioneered by the Jesuits of the Manila Observatory in terms of uh, the wider scientific network of the of the 19th century. And I have this uh, and I'm proposing this idea of the Pacific Belt of Observatories that started in the late 19th century and, and progressed until the, until the period before the war. And this Pacific Belt of Observatories is, bas is basically a network of observatories uh, that, uh, that uh, uh, emerged locally. Okay, so uh, the, uh, the Jesuits in Manila, uh, the Jesuits in Sikaway, the the uh, British Imperial uh, Meteorological Agency in Hong Kong, the uh, the the Europeans who pioneered the and Europeans and the Chinese who pioneered the the Imperial Maritime Customs uh, Weather Services in 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 China, uh, similar with Japan, etc. So I'm I'm trying to to connect or trying to to study this <laughs> this network that started in the 19th century, and we can move. Uh, a little bit backwards, okay. And uh, if we're going to uh, look at the earlier established Jesuit networks, okay, that uh, uh, that is basically uh, the network, the mission network of the Jesuits in Asia. We can we can move back maybe mm -hmm. until the 18th century. So mm -hmm. so uh, through research, I think through research, more research, we can we can uh, 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 put into the, 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 uh, the, the conventional teaching of, of, of history, these ideas uh, or this framework in Southeast Asian studies wherein we, we identify the interconnectedness of the region. And we can prove that the Philippines, unlike the, the, the again, the conventional view, we're, we're not separated. We're not a, right. a, a missing piece of the process that, that was taken out. Uh, uh, during the Spanish colonial period, so I think I have uh, I have talked a lot. So I think <laughs> no, that's other, other I'd like to see I'd like to see. Um, but Patrick and uh, Patrick and Luana, I wanted to ask. Um, we since we're talking about teaching and BA curriculum, Patrick, you mentioned that in your university you were introducing a course in environmental history, and I wondered what in the planning stages what you thought the themes would be. And Luana, I'd like to ask you, um, if you collaborated, if you could imagine collaborating with a historian, you know, doing a joint course on geography and history in this period, what do you think would be, how, what would the themes be? So I, I'll just, you know, you could just think about it, but Patrick, you're, you're, you're already in the planning stages, right? For the course that you're yes, offering we, uh, uh, right now um, we are just um, we're not yet uh, done with the the actual uh, contents of the the subject mm -hmm. environmental history but hopefully uh, within the this term or this semester we'll be able to complete it ma'am but mm -hmm. as far mm -hmm. as the academics is concerned I, I would I would agree with the uh, uh, Sir Kirby and Sir Raul regarding the you know, early modern period as a work in, in progress when it comes to the academics in the Philippines, considering the periodization that is given in, in the different uh, uh, levels of uh, schools in the Philippines right now is still patterned after the traditional way, even our public school system or even our books uh, that are written by the Department of Education are still in the traditional. But uh, it is still, uh, but I think in, in, in the future, uh, there would be substantial changes. <laughs> uh, but I think, Mom, to borrow your, the words from your book, which um, is an excellent uh, a, a book on Southeast Asian history uh, in early modern Southeast Asia, you mentioned about 
the early modern period is specific time span in Southeast Asian history. And the most distinctive feature is the degree to which South Southeast Asian societies became integrated into a global system of economic and cross-cultural exchange. Geography of Southeast Asia is far more than a background to past developments where it has been fundamental in shaping the way regional histories has evolved. I think, mom, the problem with the Philippines is that given that it was an archipelago, it was separated from the um, uh, from the other parts of Southeast Asia, and given also the, the colonial intrusion of the Spaniards uh, with strict censorship, and uh, the Spaniards uh, were able to define the boundaries and a strong definition of boundaries. But mm -hmm. I think with uh, more research, uh, mm -hmm. especially in giving technical capacity in capacitating our archaeologists, uh, there would be more information and uh, timely learning on the early modern period, mm -hmm. which I think should be one of the focus of uh, Filipino historians, especially mm -hmm. the, the young ones. But mm -hmm. of course, the problem here is the, uh, the funding. Uh, but of course, uh, we know that the field work in archaeology, aside from the, it is very time consuming, uh, you have to uh, also uh, use a lot of um, funding for this one. Uh, but uh, in order to combat this challenge, I think there should be more partnership and collaboration and trainings uh, between institutions and universities uh, all over the world so that we'll be able to come up with uh, more researches and uh, information regarding the early modern period. Well, I think, I think in a, in, in just in, in the closing section of this webinar, we can talk more about this public intera interaction because I think that's where a lot of work can be done. But I, I do agree with all of you that the, 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 the textbooks, the textbooks that are available are off because teachers teach to the textbooks. You know, they, they, they rarely depart heavily from the textbooks that are available. So and writing textbooks is not always a way to high promotion. So it's, and it's often getting that new research into the textbooks and getting the textbooks published so that they get into the schools. It's, it takes a generation. But, um, but if you excite students, if students are excited by what you're telling them, they may go into their schools or they may go to teachers. They may do a lot of this work for you. So Luan, could I come back to you? What do you think, how would you try and present this interdisciplinary relationship in a way that would grab students? What, what would, so you've got some geography students in your class, you've got some history students, you want them to see those kinds of connections, how interdisciplinary relations can really work. What would you do? Okay. Um... That's a very interesting question. Um, if I have a class composed of history and geography students, and I would like them to be interested in environmental history, um, I think I, I would make them realize how, how there are so much potential when it comes to exploring their own interests are with regard to environmental history. So for example, um, um, just also to connect it with what you have been talking about earlier about the, the specific uh, periodization. Um, for example, um, we could um, encourage the students to explore more the idea of scale. You have these um, global and regional um, processes that are happening outside the Philippines and um, entering the Philippines, but the rate at which such processes are able to enter um, different parts of the country or the degree to which um, each communities are able to integrate to that kind of system varies. So the idea of scale is one thing um, to make them realize that, that um, these are possible um, tracks of research and also we could get them um, interested in the idea that um, you can actually look at how, uh, for example, in the case of indigenous people, how their relationships with the environment um, change through time mm -hmm. as influenced by different factors. For example, um, how the governments adapted 
to this um, um, global and regional processes that are happening around them. Because, for example, in the case of um, the Ibaloy and Kankanae indigenous group, um, they are located at the Cordilleras, uh, which were among the regions mm -hmm. that um, somehow were able to resist um, colonization, uh, Spanish colonization for quite a while. So in terms of how um, regional transformations impacted their communities might be different in terms mm -hmm. of the periodization than what the other what the other places in the Philippines are experiencing. So um, it is a very complex world <laughs> um, yeah. if we're going to think about the spatial component and more so um, uh, made complicated by the temporal aspect. So mm -hmm. Um, I'm sure that uh, that kind of situation and that kind of yes, that kind of situation opens so many possibilities uh, mm -hmm. for exploration and research that would um, capture the interests of the students. They can also think about how environmental history um, changed the role of women in the community. So mm -hmm. in the my community uh, that I uh, looked into, um, when corporate mining was introduced in that area, and that's a very significant change, that, uh, the first commercial uh, mining company was established in 1903. Um, such introduction um, 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 initiated change in how resources are extracted and how women were excluded in the process in the sense that um, such kind of uh, mining activity would require migrant labor. So things like that. There, um, environmental history in the context of space, in the context of time, has so much potential. So I, I think I would start with that to make them you know, appreciate uh, the different perspectives. Thank you, so, Miss. Well, I can see I'd be enthusiastic, see an enthusiastic student in your class, I know. Um, well, we have a, a just a short while left before we should open. I see, can, I, I hear there are some questions from the uh, participants or the attendees in this webinar. But we've, we've okay, we've got a classroom. We've got excited students in the classroom. How do we move beyond the lecture room to the public? How do we excite the public? How do we create a partnership? So um, Professor Acabado has all done, of course, and I know the projects that you've been working with have done a lot of that. So I'm just opening it up to all of you now. What with, with internet facilities, with, with mobile phone, and we have so many tools at our disposal now to connect beyond the university. Are we using those tools as well as we should? Are there things we more things we can do? So yes, Kirby. Well, uh, I think it, it, this is uh, the most opportune time to talk about the environment, to talk about the disasters. Uh, in, the, in, in the current pandemic that we are experiencing right now, we should talk about how uh, environments, how nature, how, how human communities and human societies uh, are, are, are uh, in, uh, interrelated or complexly connected with uh, each other. Okay? Uh, in my view, uh, for example, in the case of the Philippines, since the enactment of the of the present disaster risk uh, reduction management act uh, in in 2010 and that law that particular law was uh, was passed after the after the uh, what we call the uh, the, the tragedy of, of, uh, of the monsoon tragedy or basically after the typhoon on Doi hit Manila, uh, the, the government was uh, prompted uh, that it should uh, strengthen and, and, and uh, uh, intensify the, the idea of disaster risk reduction. So the concept of disaster risk reduction was uh, basically institutionalized uh, on a national level. Okay? And and this uh, this idea or, or this uh, the passage of this law basically mandated all local government units to to allot uh, uh, certain parts of their of their uh, internal internal revenue allotment or or LGU funds or or for disaster risk reduction and it's a really an, a great opportunity to to engage the people into the to the value of of environmental history. Uh, uh, for us to understand or for us to craft 
uh, history, historically aware and historically conscious disaster risk reduction management plans. Okay? So it has been pointed out, for example, by, by a lot of experts, for example, geologists and, and uh, geologists from the University of the Philippines. Uh, uh, we have a, a, a recently established institution, we call it the UP Resilience Institute, and they're really engaging local communities in the importance of, of understanding the history of a particular place and to, to understand the disasters that they are experiencing right now. Uh, for example, uh, when, when Typhoon Sendong hit Northern Mindanao, uh, a lot of people were really caught off guard because uh, in the past experiences, there were, uh, there, there were typhoons that, uh, that, was passing, that were passing by do that part of northern Mindanao. Do, that's why when when Sendong uh, 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 devastated northern Mindanao, a lot of people were caught off guard because they had no memory of of, of, of this particular type of of disaster. Similar with uh, what happened in 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 the area of Samar and Leyte during uh, after the the onslaught of Typhoon Yolanda. Okay, so. Uh, one of the things that, that were pointed out by anthropologists who did work or did field work in the area uh, was because most of the cities or most of the towns uh, that uh, were hit by Yolanda were, were now dominated by migrants from other places and they have no memory of, 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 the, of, the, of the previous typhoons that hit uh, uh, the region. And, and based on the research of some scholars, uh, uh, the, the 2013 uh, Yolanda typhoon in, in Samar and Leyte uh, is very much similar with the, the 1897 typhoon that was documented by Jose Algue in 1897. So, so researching on that okay, or, 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 or highlighting and making it a public uh, discussion will, will, will really help the, the, the crafting of, of proactive disaster risk management uh, programs in the local communities. So, that's it. Uh, does, Raul, do you have anything, would you like to add anything to that um, in your own experience or Patrick? Um, perhaps David, in, the, in Vietnam, how have you been able, or have, is there a possibility of engaging the public with these with these kinds of concerns how can you interest non historic non academics in um, what's going on i think in telling new stories um, there are ways to do this and we have to get into the politics of publishing in philippines in vietnam uh, and the pressure sometimes about what gets published and what gets silenced. Um, this is always a case in the Socialist Republic of Vietnam, but it's changed recently. And um, also in ways of imagining the future. Um, mm -hmm. we, don't, we talk about the past, we don't talk about futures, but um, there's a film that some overseas Vietnamese producers made uh, about a future, uh, southern vietnam that's underwater like a water world and um you know a sort of a dystopic future but dystopic futures kind of point back to what went wrong right mm -hmm. and and there's a there are different ways of, of playing with those ideas so i think to the extent that history and new historical work can can lead to new stories and especially mm -hmm. local stories that push back against nationalism or this historiography that's compartmentalized. Um, they can they can be really powerful in, in fiction too, not just nonfiction. Has has any museum in the Philippines um, held an exhibition on memories of environmental events or that you know of? I mean, because that's one way of, of course, you can reach the public in many ways, but one of the ways is bringing you know, people go and visit museums, visit, visit exhibitions. I'm just thinking of ways of kind of bridging that gap that so often exists between the university walls and the general public. And so we can have our projects like, like the ones that you're all working with, particularly Patrick, with local communities. Um, 
but getting those the work that's done in those projects into a larger picture beyond that community and into the national or even international arena takes perhaps different kinds of strategies. Um, but as David said, telling different stories can certainly can certainly help um, be a major contribution, I think, to that process. I think uh, for for um, for, his, uh, for history departments and historical organizations, uh, for decades uh, they had been collaborated with uh, the local government uh, in uh, in creating a local history. So for me, one way of connecting with the public, one way of engaging with the public is through local history. Mm -hmm. and, and what we need, I think, is to um, revise or I think um, put something else in how we deal with local history. So for instance, introduce new perspectives and methods that will really interest them. So I, I think for me, uh, one way of engaging with the public is to look at, is to use local history because for them, uh, that's, that's is something that they can relate to. Uh, mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. is something that they can see around them. So mm -hmm. for instance, introduce cultural mapping, introduce heritage mapping, uh, heritage may can also be uh, urban environment, industrial environment. So, and then um, uh, and by by including by by in, injecting this kind of new methods to to local uh, history, uh, that's one way of promoting environmental history uh, with the kind of history that the local people are, are more interested in. So that's I think for me that's a step towards. Uh, uh, engaging with other uh, uh, other fields such as uh, anthropology or archaeology. So, uh, in other words, uh, make use of what we have now, uh, uh, the, the local history, and try to sort of revise it or mm -hmm. uh, inject more perspectives mm -hmm. and methods so that uh, it can continue to attract uh, the locals to, um, to be part of the of creating their own uh, local narratives. I think that's a very good note to finish. And, and I think we can remember that uh, we used to think of local histories as just the written word, but now we have the opportunity to present local histories in visual forms, in audio forms, in uh, all kinds of ways that uh, can engage a generation that is less and less, I'm afraid, inclined to read books. They, they look at their phones, they, they're, they're more visually oriented than perhaps in the, in the past. So I can see that um, we've, we've run it slightly over time, but I want to thank you all for all your, everything you've, you've said and all the contributions you've made. And I think we can open the floor up now for Q&A, if people can put their questions in the chat. Um, Barbara, excuse me. While waiting for the questions, can I just present something that's related to- Yes, the yes, yes, question? of course. Um, this is just really quick. And I'm actually pr um, proud of this activity of our department, which might also um, interest um, some of you. But we are actually um, doing um, participatory 3D mapping for disaster risk reduction. I, I'm not sure if you can um, yeah. see this. So it's um, mm -hmm. sorry. Um, one interesting way to get the public involved uh, uh, regarding um, disaster risk reduction and another opportunity for environmental history to be included in this approach. So um, the idea here is to let members of the community um, map the hazards in their area, identify structures, um, sp safe spaces, areas that uh, get flooded. So in the process, um, it's, it's a good opportunity to, again, to teach 
and at the same time learn new information um, from the members of the community. So I think one um, one possibility is to also include in such activities the idea of um, the history of disasters in such areas. So this is just uh, one of the ways, but and this is one of the um, extension activities being um, done by our department. Uh, uh, especially if there's a community that requested for such kind of activity. So just um, um, in for another information about uh, possible methods to engage the public. That's all. Thank you. No, thank you very much. Well, it, it, there, there was one comment at the end from Michelle who just, who just uh, which sort of hinges on yours, just that this helping to update the school curriculum there could be some the same kind of webinars seminars that you're talking about but particularly for school teachers and um to, to sort of train the teachers again so i think there are multiple ways in which we can kind of a, a light a, um light up community interest but i'm turning now to the chat and to the formal questions that i've asked and i i, I we have a, a time, I think. So I'd just like to go through the questions as they were posted, and they were mostly addressed to particular people. So, Kirby, you're you're on the mat first, um, and it was particularly a question about the document you showed in your um, slide, and and the question was whether the residents' petition did they get a response at all? Was there anything in the documents that showed there was any reply or? Anything done to address their concerns? Okay, so uh, uh, I didn't I didn't uh, find any any response from the from the colonial government, and usually uh, uh, those kinds of petitions are, are are lodged in 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 offices. Some of them uh, uh, didn't uh, don't some of those petitions don't usually get proper uh, responses. Unless, uh, unless uh, uh, those uh, petitions were of a really great concern, and just some of the or or basically the people just uh, just do uh, uh, the the uh, actions needed with with some sort of uh, approval at the very least uh, from the alcalde mayor or the or the town. Uh, town heads of community. So I haven't I haven't seen uh, a, a particular reply to that to that document. But based on a study by a colleague in the Asian Center, uh, uh, the uh, 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 that particular document is part of a series of, of, of documents dealing with land issues between uh, the town of uh, the town of Tayabas and the the nearby town of Sariaya. So, so the the natives were were in some sort of an infighting uh, for years uh, uh, for the ownership of certain tubigan or 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 rice fields in mm -hmm. uh, in the area. So, but uh, but uh, what I want to point out in that particular document is the the idea that the natives. At some sort of agency when it comes to to disaster rehabilitation efforts in communities. So, yeah, that's it. Well, I think the the there's a an, a follow on question from that, but that I think relates both to you and to Patrick about how the extent to which these kind of of um, local responses were um, were incorporated into um, into government into government responses so the one of the questions to patrick was were the indigenous responses of the indigenous people that you to natural disasters were they taken on board when government and social policy was being formed or reframed uh in in the area that you looked at um based on our uh, engagement with the IP community that we have uh, and went into. Uh, Ma'am, in terms of national policy, I think we, we already have the IPRA law or the Indigenous Peoples Reforms, Reform Act. And then we have uh, several laws on uh, disasters as well as reformatting the uh, national offices uh, engaged in disaster management. And uh, I think also the involvement of the 
we have seen that in Mindanao, uh, particularly in the province of Bukidnon, that uh, the local government uh, engages the the, you know, the services of the uh, of the indigenous people within that particular locality, and uh, they really wanted to push through with a law uh, concerning the. Uh, a, a part of which will be the amendment probably to our local government code in order to incorporate uh, indigenous people's representation within uh, the different uh, local councils, uh, the legislative councils of each municipality, so that in areas where there is a large number of concentration of population of the IP community, they should be given at least the opportunity uh, to be represented in their specific uh, <laughs> local governments so that they will be able to participate in, uh, in the policymaking process, uh, at least within the province or within the municipality to which they belong. And the part of which is also the engagement to the uh, environment and natural disasters. Mm -hmm. it's, I think representation is obviously a critical, a critical factor that, um, yes, people deserve. So, Ro, um, it's quite a different question for you. How did the natives' artistic representations of flora and fauna um, affect the, the objective and scientific understanding of natural history? Did was that? Um... Mm. I think in terms of uh, visualizing um, the flora and fauna, uh, naturalists have had to follow certain uh, visuals in, in 18th century or 19th century uh, because uh, these visuals, the, the audience for these visuals are not Filipinos. Uh, they are meant to be presented to uh, the European audiences, the Western audiences. So I think um, uh, native illustrators were instructed specifically mm -hmm. on the kind of uh, uh, parts of the specimen that they have to highlight, uh, things like that, uh, in order to, of course, allow uh, the scientists and the naturalists uh, in, in Europe to examine these specimens without getting the real specimens. So I think that's the the the, the important uh, factor there. So in terms of influencing or in terms of asserting their own uh, artistic um, uh, artistry in in this in natural history visuals, I think. Um, most likely there's, uh, they cannot really impose their own um, uh, artistic uh, uh, artistry in these visuals uh, because they have to be conformed to uh, uh, what had been uh, the practice uh, in, in, in Europe, yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, if I could just intervene, it's extremely rare, unfortunately, in the kind of sources that are available for this period for us to find a local voices as, as has been mentioned or even their own representation of the world that they was was around them there are some rare examples in in the uh, royal in in thailand there were um, a few years ago some maps uh, recovered from the 1770s and the interesting thing about these is where they show borders. Do the people have a, a concept of an environment where there is a line between their territory and the next territory? And it seems that in some cases you can see that often it's a river or a mountain or something like that. So you can see early conceptions of, of, of political thinking sometimes being shaped around the environment as, as well. But David, we were talking, you were talking about growing up in a fishing area, and we haven't talked a lot about the sea right now. And one of the comments uh, from Michelle says um, that, that maybe we should be looking at sea level changes and, um, and as well as geolo geological proxies on the environment, but particularly, I think, sea level rises or sea level changes 
are something that that many people are concerned about now, certainly in Hawaii, we're looking at how much land we're going to be losing in 30 years time. So um, is, do you think that that's an area that's um, to which historians can contribute? What do you that, think, David? Def definitely. Um, you know, the recent events in the South China Sea with all the nations, including Philippines involved, um, has changed our attention about where, where the sovereignty ends and where it begins. Um, you know, there's, there's a great book, it, it's a very impossible to read by uh, uh, Paul Carter. He's a wonderful, very creative uh, theorist, literary theorist and, and artist. He has a book called Decolonizing Gover Governance. And um, uh, sorry, the uh, archipelagic thinking, archipelagic thinking, Thank thinking. And what he's pushing back against is this idea of national space being the coastlines and everything inside of it. And, and this also applies to indigenous experiences where indigenous spaces within the territory, like in the Cordillera, you know, are sort of these, you know, island-like spaces on, on these inside spaces. Um, so I think that the recent changes in both politics, but also sea level change and seeing cities in, in Southeast Asia in danger of flooding and what that does to these spaces um, is, it is prompting a kind of reassessment of early history and early modern history. Um, I'll just say that um, there's a scholar in Australia, Lee Tana, who's, she's a Vietnam scholar, but she's working on a study of maritime Vietnamese um, history. And Vietnam is always considered a, a mainland, a land-based country, right? But this is, um, it's, it's a rewriting in some ways of, of that experience. So I think, I think yes, I think, I think there are a lot of interesting possibilities to get off the land in a sense and, and follow these, these routes. Um, the questions are piling in and I'm afraid, I apologize to the audience, I'm afraid we, we won't have time to deal with all of them, but there is a couple of uh, ones that I think are quite pertinent here. Um, Jack Madrana has, has commented, really, it's a comment rather than a question, but he says the academic, the non-academic public has to be able to see, to see that they can personally use the information that's being presented to them. That, um, and he suggests starting with cultural workers and tourism and, and working towards other people who, who can use the information that we're providing. And we talked about memories and reminding people that this, that this particular disaster is very similar to some of the others. But I, I think that's a good point that um, the people have not, not only participating, but to be able to use the information that we're giving. And I turn now to um, maybe one of, maybe just um, keeping the not final, but near to final question. Um, as from um, Professor Stark, Miriam Stark, who says um, she'd like to, she, she says, it strikes me that imagining an early modern period in the Philippines is not just rather than, sim not simply an early Spanish colonial period. So, not taking Spanish colonialism and saying, oh, we had early modern Spanish colonialism, but taking it out of the colonial period and, and, provide, and taking it back to local histories that would provide a counterbalance to the focus on Spanish colonial activity. So what are your thoughts on that? Um, can, is that feasible to take local history to create an early modern Philippine, a field of early modern history in the Philippines that does not focus 
on what the Spanish are, are doing. I, I think uh, there had there are already works on on on, on that kind of of um, of story. Uh, for instance, the our late colleague uh, Professor Dante Ambrosio has done something about ethno astronomy, uh, doing combining um, ethnography and historical records in examining the uh, indigenous perception of of uh, of the galaxy, of the of the of the sky, and I think there are already uh, works on um, on that kind of uh, nature. But uh, I must confess that we need more of this, um, uh, and they have already laid the foundation for uh, young historians, and the the work must continue. I think, no, uh, uh, highlighting the indigenous story. Uh, prior to the colonial period. Uh, well, I, th I think that that's a kind of an opportunity for me in my role as moderator. <laughs> Just um, so when you're looking towards the future, and this is really a question for all of you, when you, you we've talked a lot about young people, young historians, young researchers, um, where do you think a environmental history in Southeast Asia, but particularly the Philippines, the early modern period um, in Southeast Asia, but particularly as it, in its infancy now, but in the Philippines, how do you see it developing? Where do you think it will be in say 10 years time? You'll all be senior professors by that time. So very senior. But uh, um, where do you think where do you think the field will be? Will we have? Do you think the traditional past, the traditional way of of focusing on on politics and governments, will be passe, or do you think it's so entrenched it's going to be there to stay? Yes, I, I think, ma'am, there would be changes and innovations, given that uh, we recognize the importance of environmental history already, uh, given that the Philippines is one of the most uh, uh, this, uh, frequently, I mean, frequently visited by a lot of typhoons. We are in the Pacific Ring of Fire. So the much of res the research should be, I think, devoted to environmental history. And then later on, this uh, these researches might help our uh, our government, our policymakers later on, in order to craft uh, important legislations, in order to at least uh, improve the the lives and protect the people from this uh, natural disaster. So the 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 value of the environmental history is very much important, I think, uh, given also with our experience with the pandemic, I think. In the next ten years, still this will be more of specialized courses in uh, not only in the Department of History, but I think in other fields also in the social sciences. And I think too, this this is a, a time when the focus on interdisciplinary work has assumed uh, an emphasis that was not really there before, and. Um, Noel Rodriguez has just reminded us that that um, at Dilliman there there's been work on the using old maps to map out uh, lost waterways, and so I think that there's a an increasing opportunity for people to think across across disciplines to really relate to their colleagues, sometimes in the same university, that might be interested in in similar projects. So um, we've almost, we've come virtually to the end of our webinar. And I do thank all of you very much for all you, you've offered. Um, Professor Akabalo, do we have two minutes for anyone to offer their final comments? Yes. So I, we've given at least a, 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 a release from the, the time bell. 
So would any of you like to, would each of you like to add something more as a closing comment? I'd like Perhaps to thank. Add. Yes, David. I, I, I just wanna thank Barbara and Stephen and all of you for uh, a great panel. And I wish everyone is safe and healthy uh, given our continuing struggle with the pandemic. So mm -hmm. thank you. Kirby? Yes, uh, well, to, to just to, uh, to answer the, the general theme of, of most of the questions, how do we, how do we further uh, expand the reach of environmental history in the Philippines or in the region? So I encourage, uh, personally, I encourage everyone to be active in, in, uh, in organizations, in academic organizations that promote environmental history. For example, uh, uh, David and I are currently, uh, or virtually, in the in the sixth biennial uh, East Asian Environmental History Conference hosted by Kobe University. So, uh, for example, uh, uh, that particular conference happens every two years, and and uh, we encourage everyone to to join uh, the, the 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 organization or join the conference and and be part of the of of the project of expanding the discussion, expanding or deepening the research on on environmental history. So there are a lot of papers on. On the social history of the environment, on 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 meteorology and seismology, and climate, yeah, etc. So, but I think if the pan, the one good side of the pandemic is that it's really opened global communication through through Google Meet, through Zoom, through all these kinds of webinars that would never have been possible before. So I think it's opened our eyes to the kind of communication, global communication, international communication that we don't, that will not end when that happy day comes when we can put the pandemic behind us. So um, again, I thank you all very much. And I thank our audience too for your attendance and for your questions and your comments. And I will hand my baton now back to Professor Acabado, who I think has a few closing remarks to make. Thank you, thank you all. Terima kasih. Uh, you know, this is the kind of discussion that we're exactly what we're uh, expecting and envisioned. Because, uh, as you know, one of the primary goals of the program on early modern Southeast Asia is to bring together various uh, perspectives, methodologies in, in understanding environmental change and human responses to such perturbations. So panel five and the rest of the panels in this series um, is a step towards breaking disciplinary and as you say, uh, state and ethnic boundaries. Um, and it is our plan to bring this multidisciplinary engagement in, in future iterations of workshops that's going to be funded by the Lucy program. So we still have about in the next four years, we have planned um, workshops, hopefully in person and in, in Asia to, to bring more collaboration um, among and between different um, disciplines from, from all Southeast Asian region. Um, um, and as an archeologist and, and, and archeologist, are considered as, as economic and, and envir environmental historians. I am excited about the potential collaboration with geographers, historians, paleoclimatologists, and of course, archeologists. Um, reframing our work in terms of the EMP will bridge regional themes and will break parochialism of some of the disciplines that we've been um, uh, trained into. So thank you, everyone. Um, oh, before I forget, so part of uh, the loose Southeast Asia funding is uh, we have we're going to call for um, uh, call for proposals for for funding. I think we have about thirty thousand uh, or maybe fifteen thousand dollars that we'll be providing for research on the early modern period in Southeast Asia. So um, watch out for um, details um, on on that call. Um, let me call on Arlo to um, uh, give us details about the next um, panel.
All right, thank you, Professor. Hi, everyone. My name is Arlo. On behalf of the organizers of the webinar series, I um, want to thank everyone for joining us. Uh, thank you, Professor Andaya, for moderating. And uh, thank you, our panelists, for sharing your expertise with us. Like, definitely learned a lot from everyone. And yeah. Um, yeah, um, I just, uh, before promoting next week's panel, I want to share a few resources with everyone. So if you would like to rewatch this webinar or explore other resources related to Southeast Asian environmental and cultural re research, you can check us out on Facebook via the Museo de Isarog page. Uh, we are also on YouTube under the name UCLA Program for Early Modern Southeast Asia. Again, it's UCLA Program for Early Modern Southeast Asia. And yeah, we invite you to visit those web pages for additional resources and events pertaining the early modern period in Southeast Asia. Um, we also invite you to complete a short survey um, that will help us improve our future panels. And also at the end of the survey, you will be given a chance to send uh, yourself a certificate uh, proving your participation um, in today's webinar. Uh, and yeah, this is our biggest audience to date. So um, if uh, you enjoyed today, I hope you can join us next week for panel six, the future of Southeast Asian archeology span in the US. It's gonna be September 13, 7 p.m. at uh, Pacific Standard Time, and then September 14, 10 a.m. Uh, Philippine Standard Time. So yeah, uh, thank you very much. Uh, have a good night for those who are ending their day, and then those who are just starting the day, uh, may you have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Maraming <laughs> salamat. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Sir Abu.